Welcome to Voluble Minds, reflections on and abbreviated readings of famous philosophical dialogues. I'm Colin Wolfe, Assistant Director of Religious Education at the Fourth Universalist Society in New York City. If you would like to skip the introductory segment on today's Philosopher and Dialogue and go straight to the reading, the timestamp posted in the video description will help you to do that. Thank you for joining us. The 1642 to 1651 marks the period of the English Civil War, in which roundhead parliamentarians and Charles I's cavaliers confronted each other over the governing structures of the nation, eventually resulting in the monarchy being supplanted temporarily by the Commonwealth of England, with Oliver Cromwell at its head as Lord Protector. By 1660, the period Hobbes marks out for the following dialogue, Behemoth, the Stuart monarchy had returned to power with the restoration of Charles II, much to Hobbes' relief. Hobbes served as tutor to the young Charles II, so you might say he had a vested interest in the kingly reinstatement. Behemoth was published posthumously as Charles II denied Hobbes its more timely publication, mostly because it seemed a too honest appraisal of the country's situation. Behemoth is also known as the Long Parliament. Leviathan endeavored to describe what Hobbes considered a prudent relationship to government with its title taken from the book of Job, referring to the great biblical sea monster. This was Hobbes' extended metaphor, describing the awesome, fearsome, but ultimately necessary and compelling power of the state unto which men must render certain freedoms in return for corresponding securities. Fear of violent death incentivized this arrangement. So it wasn't rosy, but it was conducive to survival. Behemoth, Hobbes' follow-up to Leviathan, takes the English Civil War as its model of society unhinged and ungoverned, the nightmare scenario contrast to the austere but more salutary and orderly arrangement of yielding to the Leviathan. Behemoth is divided into four sections. Part one, Behemoth, or the epitome of the civil wars of England. Part two, both sides prepare for war. Part three, the English civil war, rise of Cromwell and the execution of Charles I. And part four, the protectorship of Oliver Cromwell, failure of Richard Cromwell, and finally the restoration of the Stuarts. This dialogue functions both as a tendentious historical summary and an examination of general ideas. Hobbes' view of rebellion and really any form of popular rule is bleak and patronizing and his sympathies are decisively royalist. While this does not flatter our modern democratic sensibilities, we might remember that Hobbes lived through this rebellion, had his safety personally threatened by it, bore exile in its midst, and was a century too soon to experience the celebrated success of the American Revolution as a more favorable counterexample, itself something that we have a tendency to romanticize, even as we alternately bemoan and extol some of the more cumbersome and iniquitous structures we owe to it. One particularly notable cut that I thought would be better read on our viewers' own time and to which I would like to direct them here is the catalog of parliamentarian demands made of Charles I to be enumerated in section two of Behemoth. You might hear a platonic and plaintive strain in Hobbes tagging rump parliamentary rule with the name of oligarchy. As we noted, Hobbes has some similarity to Erasmus in his suspension between dislike of the arbitrariness and politicking of the official churchmen, including those of the Church of England, and an uneasiness about what he saw as mob rule. For instance, you'll hear his annoyance at the Archbishop of Canterbury's mixing political work with metaphysical hair splitting, but this is contrasted with Hobbes' witty but somewhat stuffy and snobbish denigration of the Bible's new accessibility on being translated out of the Greek and Latin, giving the masses the big idea that they now could converse directly with God too. Though Hobbes was perhaps too unscrutinizing of the kingly rule under which he was fortunate enough to thrive, something that is perennially valuable in his work is his incisive summary of how populist claims in the supposed people's interest can be propagandistically weaponized, its patriotic and seemingly compassionate egalitarian account overdrawn for deceptively specialized interests, which can in turn give way to a mere substitution of one grotesque and dysfunctional power structure for another. Hobbes hardly had to make the case that all people will necessarily be at their worst given the license for doing so. The English Civil War was sufficient in his eyes to demonstrate that as long as such an element was at all allowed for in the range of human behavior, a relatively small sampling of its membership could send a nation into what he took to be unmitigated disaster, but one that thankfully came with an expiration date built into its contradictory and dissembling nature. I'm joined today by my friend and fellow actor, Braley Dagenhart, who currently works as the head of marketing at Primary Stages. She will be reading the first speaker to my second speaker today, and thus I commend myself to her tutelage. Enjoy these selections from Thomas Hobbes' Behemoth.
If in time, as in place, there were degrees of high and low, I verily believe that the highest of time would be that which passed between 1640 and 1660. For he that thence, as from the devil's mountain, should have looked upon the world and observed the actions of men, especially in England, might have had a prospect of all kinds of injustice and of all kinds of folly that the world could afford, and how they were produced by their hypocrisy and self-conceit, whereof the one is double inequity and the other double folly. I should be glad to behold that prospect. You that have lived in that time and in that part of your age wherein men used to see best into good and evil, I pray you set me that could not see so well upon the same mountain by the relation of the actions you then saw and of their causes, pretensions, justice, order, artifice, and event. In the year 1640, the government of England was monarchical and the king that reigned, Charles, the first of that name, holding the sovereignty by right of a descent continued above 600 years and from a much longer descent, king of Scotland, and from the time of his ancestor, Henry II, king of Ireland, a man that wanted no virtue, either of body or mind, nor endeavored anything more than to discharge his duties toward God in the well-governing of his subjects. How could he then miscarry, having in every country so many trained soldiers, as would put together, have made an army of 60,000 men and diverse magazines of ammunition in places fortified? If those soldiers had been, as they and all others of his subjects ought to have been, at his majesty's command, the peace and happiness of the three kingdoms had continued as it was left by King James. But the people were corrupted generally, and disobedient persons esteemed the best patriots. But sure, there were men enough, besides those that were ill-affected, to have made an army sufficient to have kept the people from uniting into a body able to oppose him. Truly, I think if the king had had money, he might have had soldiers enough in England. But there were very few of the common people that cared much for either of the causes, but would have taken any side for pay or plunder. But the king's treasury was very low, and his enemies, that pretended the people's ease from taxes and other specious things, had the command of the purses of the city of London, and of most cities and corporate towns in England, and of many particular persons besides. But how came the people to be so corrupted? And what kind of people were they that did so seduce them? The seducers were of diverse sorts. One sort were ministers, ministers as they called themselves of Christ, and sometimes, in their sermons to the people, God's ambassadors, pretending to have a right from God to govern everyone his parish and their assembly, the whole nation. Secondly, Lastly, the people in general were so ignorant of their duty as that not one, perhaps of 10,000, knew what right any man had to command him or what necessity there was of king or commonwealth for which he was to part with his money against his will, but thought himself to be so much master of whatsoever he possessed that it could not be taken from him upon any pretense of common safety without his own consent. King, they thought, was but a title of the highest honor, which gentleman, knight, baron, earl, duke, were but steps to ascend to, with the help of riches. They had no rule of equity, but precedence and custom, and he thought wisest and fittest to be chosen for a parliament that was most averse to the granting of subsidies or other public payments. In such a constitution of people, methinks the king is already ousted of his government, so as they need not have taken arms for it. For I cannot imagine how the king should come by any means to resist them. There was indeed very great difficulty in the business. Now as to that other distemper by Presbyterians, how came their power to be so great being of themselves for the most part, but so many poor scholars? This controversy between the papist and the reformed churches could not choose but make every man to the best of his power, examined by the scriptures which of them was in the right. And to that end, they were translated into vulgar tongues, Whereas before, the translation of them was not allowed, nor any man to read them, but such as had express license to do so. For the Pope did concerning the scriptures, the same that Moses did concerning Mount Sinai. Moses suffered no man to go up to it to hear God speak or gaze upon him, but such as he himself took with him. And the Pope suffered none to speak with God in the scriptures that had not some part of the Pope's spirit in him for which he might be trusted. Certainly Moses did therein very wisely and according to God's own commandment. No doubt of it, and the event itself hath made it appear so. For after the Bible was translated into English, 
every man, nay, every boy and wench that could read English, thought they spoke with God Almighty and understood what he said when by a certain number of chapters a day they had read the scriptures once or twice over. The reverence and obedience due to the Reformed Church here and to the bishops and pastors therein was cast off, and every man became a judge of religion and an interpreter of the scriptures to himself. Did not the Church of England intend it should be so? What other end could they have in recommending the Bible to me if they did not mean I should make it the rule of my actions? Else they might have kept it, though open to themselves, to me sealed up in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and fed me out of it in such measure as had been requisite for the salvation of my soul and the church's peace. I confess this license of interpreting the scripture was the cause of so many several sects as have lain hid till the beginning of the late king's reign, and did then appear to the disturbance of the commonwealth. How long had the Parliament now sat? It began November the 3rd, 1640. My Lord of Strafford was impeached of treason before the Lords, and on the 12th of May, beheaded. What did they next? After the first impeachment of the Earl of Strafford, the House of Commons, upon December the 18th, accused the Archbishop of Canterbury also of high treason, that is, of design to introduce arbitrary government, etc., for which he was... February the 18th, sent to the tower. But his trial and execution were deferred a long time till January the 10th, 1643, for the entertainment of the Scots that were come into England to aid the Parliament. Why did the Scots think there was so much danger in the Archbishop of Canterbury? He was not a man of war, nor a man able to bring an army into the field, but he was perhaps a very great politician. That did not appear by any remarkable event of his counsels. I never heard but he was a very honest man for his morals and a very zealous promoter of the church government by bishops, and that he desired to have the service of God performed and the house of God adorned as suitably as was possible to the honor we ought to do to the divine majesty. But to bring, as he did, into the state his former controversies, I mean his squabblings in the university about free will and his standing upon punctilios concerning the service books and its rubrics was not, in my opinion, an argument of his sufficiency in affairs of state. Let us now come to the military part. From York, the king went to Hull, where was his magazine of arms for the northern parts of England, to try if they would admit him. The Parliament had made Sir John Hotham governor of the town, who caused the gates to be shut and presenting himself upon the walls flatly denied him entrance, for which the King caused him to be proclaimed traitor and sent a message to the Parliament to know if they owned the action. Upon what grounds? Their pretense was this, that neither this nor any other town in England was otherwise the King's than in trust for the people of England. But what was that to the Parliament? Yes, they say, for we are the representatives of the people of England. I cannot see the force of this argument. We represent the people, ergo, all that the people have is ours. The mayor of Hull did represent the king. Is therefore all that the king had in Hull the mayor's? The people of England may be represented with limitations as to deliver a petition or the like. Does it follow that they who deliver the petition have right to all the towns in England? When began this parliament to be a representative of England? Was it not November 3rd, 1640? Who was it the day before? That is November 2nd, that had the right to keep the king out of Hull and possess it for themselves. For there was then no parliament. Whose was Hull then? I think it was the king's. Not only because it was called the king's town upon Hull, but because the king himself did then and ever represent the person of the people of England. If he did not, who then did? The parliament having no being. They might perhaps say, the people had then no representative. Then there was no commonwealth. And consequently, all the towns of England being the people's, you and I and any man else might have put in for his share. You may see by this what weak people they were that were carried into this rebellion by such reasoning as the parliament used and how impudent they were that did put such fallacies upon them. Surely they were such as were esteemed the wisest men in England being upon that account chosen to be of the Parliament. And were they also esteemed the wisest men of England that chose them? I cannot tell that.
You have seen the rump parliament in possession, as they believed, of the supreme power over the two nations of England and Ireland, and the army their servant, though Cromwell thought otherwise, serving them diligently for advancement of his own purposes. I am now, therefore, to show you their proceedings. Tell me first how this kind of government under the rump or relic of a House of Commons is to be called. It is doubtless an oligarchy, for the supreme authority must needs be in one man or in more. If in one, it is monarchy. The rump, therefore, was no monarchy. If the authority were in more than one, it was in all or in fewer than all. When in all, it is democracy. For every man may enter into the assembly which makes the sovereign court, which they could not do here. It is therefore manifest that the authority was in a few, and consequently, the state was an oligarchy. I do not see how a subject that is tied to the laws can have more liberty in one form of government than another. Howsoever to the people that understand by liberty nothing but leave to do what they list, it was a title not ungrateful. Their next work was to set forth a public declaration that they were fully resolved to maintain the fundamental laws of the nation as to the preservation of the lives, liberties, and proprieties of the people. What did they mean by the fundamental laws of the nation? Nothing but to abuse the people. Now that there was no parliament, who had the supreme power? If by power you mean the right to govern, nobody had it. If you mean the supreme strength, it was clearly in Cromwell, who was obeyed as general of all the forces in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Did he pretend that for title? No, but presently after he invented a title, which was this, that he was necessitated for the defense of the cause for which at first the parliament had taken up arms, that is to say rebelled, to have recourse to extraordinary actions. You know, the pretense of the long parliament's rebellion was salus populi, the safety of the nation against a dangerous conspiracy of papists and a malignant party at home, and that every man is bound, as far as his power extends, to procure the safety of the whole nation, which none but the army were able to do, and the parliament had hitherto neglected. Was it not then the general's duty to do it? Had he not therefore right? For that law of salus populi is directed only to those that have power enough to defend the people that is, to them that have the supreme power. Therefore, he called a parliament and gave it the supreme power to the end that they should give it to him again. Was not this witty? Mm -hmm.